Thank you for the uh, very kind introduction. It's, um, it is all down here, downhill from there. All right, so um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, visualization work and sort of uh, looking at visualization in a, a range of topics, in particular um, genetics. Uh, this is actually a bit of a um, transition probably for uh, moving into tomorrow. I do a lot of work uh, around information visualization as opposed to scientific visualization. The, the distinction being that we're dealing with abstract numbers, so we're starting with uh, numbers that don't have a particular form and actually trying to get uh, an image on those and understand what's in them. So uh, an example from Edward Tufte, uh, we have Enscombe's Quartet, you know, we can stare at these numbers, we can get a general sense of what's actually in there, we can run statistics on them, we can't actually uh, tell them apart statistically using just the, the basics, or we can just look at them and get a general sense of what's actually happening within that data. And so, uh, this, the idea is, you know, really trying to um, look at some of the most difficult problems um, and trying to create insight around very complicated numbers. So here the percentage of the chart which resembles Pac-Man shown in yellow and the percentage that does not shown in, in purple. And so uh, information visualization, we're trying to tackle these very, very difficult, very serious problems. Um, we'll talk about genetics in particular. Uh, I began doing work in genetics because uh, sort of this transition of, um, you know, this was in uh, 2000 with the completion of the human genome, uh, the draft of the human genome project. And so there's an interesting set of uh, variables to that where essentially you have this really massive, um, very complicated data set, but plus there's also this interesting social re uh, relevance to it as far as how people actually understand that data and how they use it. And so uh, to think about design in terms of how we actually look at this data, um, we can start with something like the uh, diagram of the genetic code. So uh, you know, for looking at uh, how individual DNA bases actually translate into um, uh, actual amino acids, uh, this is fairly typical. You know, so we start at the diagram over on the left-hand side. We have the second position up top, and then back over here, we actually have to go backwards through the diagram to actually figure out what amino acid we're looking at. And that this is fairly typical of what, um, you know, the diagrams in the genetic code, but obviously there's something interesting about the way that this uh, code actually works and the way that it's laid out. And so if we actually just start with uh, the order of the letters, so um, starting at the top here, this is a, a redesigned version that I did where basically you start with um, the first letter on the top, so that puts you in one of these four blocks. Uh, and then the second letter over on the left-hand side, so the next smallest letter, and you can see how uh, each of these lines up such that you don't actually have to look at what that third uh, DNA letter is. We actually know which, which amino acid we're dealing with. And like uh, a lot of design where you actually take something very fairly simple like this, one nice thing that we get is actually that the hydrophobic versus hydrophilic uh, amino acids actually uh, group together. So adding a little bit of color, we can actually see that. And then we can turn that into an interactive thing, so I can say I start with an A, and then I have a C, and then here I am at, at three amine. And so a very simple way of taking uh, this very, very basic, very fundamental diagram, and instead turning it into something that people can, uh, that you know, in the interactive case actually explains it a bit better, um, or in the static case uh, actually reveals another layer, this sort of hydrophobic versus hydrophilic relationship. Um, a lot of projects, uh, it's about starting with something, starting with a dumb idea. Um, I'm, I'm very good at this, uh, you can be too. Uh, and so the idea is to take, you know, so if you hear something like, you know, the genome is made of 3.1 billion letters of code, and um, you know, and so roughly 3% or so have some sort of known function or sort of relationship to it. Um, so, you know, what, what does that look like and how do we actually uh, explain that? So uh, we start with a small font, you know, so in this case, uh, a three-pixel font um, to show each of these A, C, G, T letters, and uh, then coloring them based on intron versus exon. So here we have in the background, this is the non-coding area. The darker areas are the uh, actual exons for genes, the sort of medium colors, the, uh, the introns of those genes. And if we actually just plot this out at uh, 17 letters per centimeter in either direction, 
Uh, this is now 13 million letters of genetic code. And so uh, this is just one quarter of uh, chromosome 21, shown uh, two and a half meters across by two and a half meters tall, uh, done for a, an art exhibition. So we can actually get a sense of what, you know, what does 13 million letters actually look like. And more recently, I had a chance to do this for, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art as part of this exhibition called the De uh, Design in the Elastic Mind. And so this is uh, an 18 foot by 19 foot wall. And across this wall is all of the uh, 72 million letters of uh, chromosome 20, I'm sorry, chromosome 18. And so here we see it blown up and then all of that data actually just kind of wallpapered onto the wall. And so, you know, uh, again, sort of starting with the dumb idea, sort of something very simple that actually shows us a little bit about scale. You know, so what does 13 million things look like? In this case, what does 72 million things look like? Can we actually kind of get our head around that? Um, and so the funny thing for this piece was actually it was, it wound up being very popular, uh, though perhaps not on its own, uh, you know, for the fact that it was genetics, but um, you know, this was the New York Times slideshow, so the opening slideshow, I was like, oh great, they're showing my piece, but actually it's because it's the introduction to the exhibit, um, people, you know, instead they use it as a sort of uh, intro photo. Um, and this was fairly common. So here are some people uh, thinking deep thoughts, looking at the intro to the exhibit. Um, some other folks clearly enjoying chromosome 18 or perhaps not aware that uh, it's actually a piece. Uh, and this guy who uh, clearly very much enjoyed uh, the exhibit itself. Um, uh, switching over to a, a bit more applied. So, uh, looking at haplotype data, so um, I began doing some work uh, in conjunction with um, David Altshuler at the Broad and uh, also Mark Daly's lab. Mark Daly's lab had just finished uh, this, uh, a set of work around this, uh, this diagram here. That it was a nature genetics paper looking at uh, haplotype block structure, or so the idea that you can actually arrange haplotypes into these block structures. Um, and they had this terrific diagram that basically showed uh, you know, how, the, uh, how those haplotypes actually broke down. It's a wonderfully dense diagram, but doesn't necessarily tell its story very directly. And so instead, um, on, and then they built a, uh, a tool that actually took this type of data, made it usable, and actually, uh, so you could, you know, compute these, these haplotype blocks. Um, I did a redesigned version of that to just take the, uh, the software that they had to clean it up into you know, just doing very basic uh, graphic design type of things where you're trying to subtract out uh, some of the uh, additional pieces that aren't necessarily needed. So for instance, on this uh, left-hand side, we have, you know, all the percentages. There's a zero point in front of everything. Um, if you actually take this out and we multiply everything by 100, we can actually make a more readable version over here. We get rid of the extra outlines. We can uh, clean things up. And so, these are all very, very basic, very simple design principles that are being applied, but the idea is that we're actually, uh, you know, in, in addition to making things clearer, we're actually making it more useful because I can now make a, uh, I can actually fit more information uh, into this diagram because it's been cleaned up. So as this has been uh, shrunken for the screen, this is still readable, yet this, you know, we've now started losing uh, some of that fidelity. And also some things like, Instead of having the genome at a 45 degree angle, we can actually you know, see where things are actually located along the genome. Um, another way of looking at the same data, this was uh, another group who you know, was proposing this idea of uh, LD units, so linkage uh, disequilibrium, and you know, plotting that out across that same uh, type of region. Uh, another, another representation by um, another group was looking at, you know, well, for a, a particular SNP, it's always gonna be one of two variations. So instead, we can uh, size things based on how large they actually are and then do these, these two colors. And so I thought it would be interesting actually to take all of those representations, you know, because we're talking about the same data and instead put them into the same, uh, a single diagram. And so here we have, you know, sort of starting with this uh, more qualitative way of looking at the data. Um, I can expand things out to actually see the uh, the individual letters, so this is using the data from that original uh, piece from Nature Genetics, so 76% have this GGAC uh, block, and then 18% have this other, uh, the other one down below there. 
And so by adding a little bit of interaction, I can deal with, you know, do I want to see uh, where things are actually located on the genome, or do I actually want to see um, the letters themselves? I can, uh, in order to get a better look at these individual blocks, I can move over into 3D, and so now I can uh, see these gray bars and get a sense of how these, uh, these different blocks actually connect. And then having done that, I might click on a particular uh, bar and see how that uh, actually connects or what, what are the other uh, blocks that go along with that one. But in general, this is actually a, a waste of this additional uh, dimension of data, and so instead I can add a, uh, another set of information to it. So this, let's take this LD unit diagram or it might be recombination rate or something like that. And so we can really say, you know, how does this actually compare to the block definition? How fragile is that, uh, that definition? And by having done that, I can now look at it from the top and get exactly that diagram. And so we're taking, you know, quite literally different perspectives on that set of information and trying to get a sense of what's, uh, what's actually in there. And so for that piece, we actually then went, uh, and when the HapMap project finished, uh, we took the uh, CFTR region of the genome and uh, looked at that across the three uh, HapMap populations and used that for the, uh, the cover of Nature for uh, October of 2005. And so in looking at this, uh, this type of thing, we're actually getting into a, a, a kind of process. And what, what typically happens is that, um, you know, when doing a visualization or starting to work with data and trying to understand it, we start out with this, you know, with how we acquire the data and then we parse it. This tends to be the domain of computer science. Then, you know, filtering it and mining it, we get our, our best statisticians and data mining people to uh, address that. And then it's kind of thrown over the wall to people who are designers and, um, or not. Uh, and the, uh, dealing with, you know, how you represent it and how you visually refine it, you know, so that the type of thing uh, Tufti likes to talk about. Or, you know, finally you have this field of uh, human computer interaction that's looking at how you actually interact with the data. And the, the problem is by stratifying these things across all these different fields, uh, we wind up with less than, uh, less than ideal results because the issue is actually it's, it's one field. It's data and how we understand it. Uh, and instead what we've done is try to segment things into, well, it's, you know, we have the designer do that and we have the programmer do this. And instead, you know, how can we actually pull these different things together? And in practice, the way that it typically works is that you start out with uh, getting some data, parsing through it, building a basic representation, and then from that, you've learned something about what's actually in that data set, and you kind of work backwards and say, what is, what is the question? What do I actually want to pull out of this information, and what can I actually explain with this diagram? Um, and the, the real important part of you know, how these different pieces actually fit together and why you need to uh, integrate them is essentially because of how uh, the iterative process. So, uh, in fact, the way that you represent things might affect how you actually filter through the data, or the way you, you represent them might affect the way that you acquire data or what data that you actually include. And so, you really can't uh, sort of stop at the middle and say, well, let's, you know, let designers sort of figure out uh, the rest of it. Instead, you know, again, how do we go from data to, to how we understand it? Um, so, looking at this across another uh, set of topics. So, um, scale winds up being an enormous um, uh, issue. You know, as I talked about the uh, millions of letters of, of DNA, what, you know, what can we actually do that, do with that? Um, but, so your uh, deep thought for the day is, ever noticed that world maps don't include street names? Um, and the, the issue is, you know, uh, if you're looking at data at various levels, um, you need a, a different way to address it. So uh, here, for instance, with the UCSC genome browser, this is what 150 bases looks like. Here's what 10,000 bases looks like, and here's what 600,000 bases looks like. And so across this, um, what's happened is that we actually were looking at the, the street maps, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the street names, even though we're out here at sort of world map scale. So out at 600,000 letters, SNPs probably not very useful at that level, or you know, repeats, or um, some of this other stuff. And so you know, really you want to think about what's actually relevant at these different uh, levels of scale. 